the third disease-specific brain tumor webinar in the series for May to coincide with uh, Brain Tumor Awareness Month. I'm Bruce Campbell. And I'm Alan Campbell, and we co-founded Phenoc Foundation, the nonprofit uh, that was set up three years after our son's diagnosis with an anaplastic appendiloma. Thank you uh, to viewers joining us from near and far. We specifically held today's session at uh, four o'clock Pacific time so that we could accommodate our friends and families in the Southern Hemisphere and particularly Australia where you might have guessed I'm originally from. Today you'll be hearing from world-renowned PNOC doctors specialising in appendomoma, uh, the current state of research and clinical trials, and you know the latest in thinking from these doctors who are dedicated to changing the outcomes of this specific childhood brain cancer. Yeah, and you'll also meet a patient family and hear her story and get her insight. Uh, the purpose really of today is information sharing. So we have a wide range of viewers from those families that have a newly diagnosed child to maybe someone with a recurrence or a long line of treatment. So we want all of your questions and so please add them to the chat. So we've got a great panel to answer all of those. For those of you joining us for the first time for one of these uh, webinars, the Pacific Pediatric Neuro-Oncology Consortium or PNOC as we refer to it, is now one of the leading global pediatric brain cancer consortiums with study sites in the US, Europe, Australia and Israel, striving to improve outcomes through a unique collaborative approach and information sharing of the latest findings in brain tumor biology and translo translating those directly into clinical research for more effective treatments. A key mechanism to support the translational research is through these unique disease specific uh, working groups through scientific collaboration and consensus, the most promising clinical trials are developed and advocacy and philanthropic groups are invited to lead and lend their perspective to the partnership as well. PNOC Foundation is the nonprofit foundation where they set up to create, um, excuse me, to create, to lead all of the fundraising awareness and support for the PNOC scientific consortia. So the doctors could do what they do best. And without further ado, um, it's a great honor to, in, uh, to introduce our distinguished panel today. We've got Dr. Mariella Philbin, co-director for research, pediatric neuro-oncology program, assistant professor of pediatrics, Harvard Medical School, associate member, Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT, Dana-Farber Boston Children's Cancer and Blood Disorder Center. Dr. Eugene Wong, pediatric neuro-oncologist, PNOC Appendomoma Research Group, Associate Division Chief Oncology, Children's National Hospital, Washington, D.C., and somebody who's very near and dear to our heart, Dr. Torin Yop, Director, Pediatric Radiation Oncology, uh, Massachusetts General Hospital, Professor Harvard Medical School, Chair of Quality Improvement Committee at the Francis H. Bird Proton Therapy Center. Dr. Yop was our radiation oncologist uh, 11 years ago um, when our son was diagnosed with, with actually an appendomoma. Um, and we spent a month out in Boston getting uh, proton therapy with Dr. York and completely coincidentally with today's webinar, our son turned 17 on Tuesday, um, which is obviously, you know, a miraculous milestone. We celebrate all of his birthdays and, uh, you know, we're extremely fortunate to be where we are. And, you know, it's one of the things that uh, has really inspired us to try and do more in this field so that uh, other families have more outcomes like ours. Yes, we couldn't be more grateful. Um, in addition, we have some esteemed doctors joining also on the panel today to help answer some of those questions. We've got Dr. Sabina Mueller, PNOC co-founder and project leader, assistant professor of clinical neurology at UCSF, Dr. Uh, Dr. Michael Prados, PNOC co-founder, also emeritus professor, Charles B. Wilson, professor of neurosurgery and professor of pediatrics, and Dr. Cassie Klein, Attending Physician Director, Neuro-Oncology, Clinical Research, Courtney Rose Foundation, Clinical Researcher in Neuro-Oncology, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and PNOC Director of Data Quality and Integration. Thank you for joining. We're also honored to have joining a, spe a special patient family guest, Lindsay campbell Rehead. Uh, um, so if you haven't already kind of figured it out, this is really a rock star panel. And it's a very special opportunity to really have access to some of the brightest minds and the latest thinking in the, in the field of appendomoma. Um, last, certainly not least, we've got Rachel Cassells, a PNOC Foundation team member, who'll be uh, helping to facilitate um, the Q&A 
and uh, helping with moderation. So our first question is for the doctors. I'm going to direct this one to Dr. Philbin, but feel free to take this as organically as you'd like. What was the state of this disease 10 years ago? Um, you know, I can I know it's changed a lot since they are diagnosed. And what's the state of the disease right now relative to that? Yes, thank you so much uh, for inviting me. This is really a great, great um, idea and wonderful opportunity to share of so much of what had happened in the last 10 years with all of you guys. And ependymoma is really um, one of these diseases that's very different from all the other brain tumors in several ways. One of the most important one, I think, is that it is not really driven by many genetic mutations or underlying chromosomal problems as so many other cancers. And it's in that sense really more a, a disease of development gone wrong. And we really haven't understood so far why those tumors even occur. And we're just starting to understand where they come from, like from which cells and when they are formed. But compared to 10 years ago, there's also, there's a few things that we do know now. One of them is the molecular classification of ependymoma that we just didn't know until 2018, pretty much. We now have every single ependymoma occurring in a special part of the brain divided up in three different molecular entities. And even that is even further being subdivided as we have more publications to this very important topic. And why is that exciting for us? It gives us more information about every person's, every child's tumor so that we can tailor therapies a little bit better and also tell our parents and all families about the prognosis a little bit more than we were able to, uh, to do 10 years ago. So there's a lot to come. I feel epidemoma is this field where a lot is changing at the moment and even more so, I'm glad to be here with you today to share more of this information. Yeah, with all that change and all these new tumor subtypes, um, this would be a good question for Dr. Wong. It says, based on all that information, how does this affect treatment? Like what's different now? Well, I, I, I wish that I could say it affected treatment tremendously, but unfortunately, you know, I think that ependymoma has been um, sort of an insidious and somewhat terrible burden at the same time. You know, I think that um, when we think about an ependymoma that comes to us, the sort of the historical diagnostic and treatment paradigms are really just uh, once you have the MRI, then you do the surgery, you try to take all that tumor out. And then you do focal radiotherapy, as Dr. Yak knows very well, if you can. And, and then you sort of are done with treatment. And the reason that that happened was because there was so much conflicting information about whether putting children through more intensive therapies was better than just doing surgery and radiation. And there's no question that some children were cured with that approach alone. Um, and I think that the particularly insidious part that the molecular and biological advances have not yet affected in the clinic yet is that unlike some of the pediatric brain cancers, which are rapidly aggressive, Ependymomas can be much more sort of insidious, but at the same time be um, sort of uh, un, well, undef indefatigable and basically will continue to come back and progress if it's going to come back and progress again. What that means is that, you know, we think about sometimes, oh, if your brain tumor has stayed in remission for a couple of years, then the chances are very strong that you've been cured at that point. And if it's three or four or five years even, then we really start to say that those patients are doing quite well. And we sort of not forget about them, but we sort of say, okay, well, we don't have to worry about those patients quite as much. Mm -hmm. One of the most particularly challenging parts for a pneumoma is that we couldn't actually convert our same windows or perspectives over to children with a pneumoma because those tumors sometimes grow a little bit more slowly, come back a little bit more, um, a little bit later than we would have expected for some of the other tumors. And so it's only in the last several years that from a clinical perspective, we've really realized that unfortunately, if those tumors do come back and most in most children it does, that, uh, that you're probably seeing the future, the sort of the future painted, which is gonna be a, a cycle of treatments which can halt or arrest that tumor's growth for some time, but that sort of inexorably that tumor will come back. And so ultimately there's been so much exciting information about the biology and that really gives us all great hope that we're on the edge of really trying to find those treatments that are gonna be permanently curative for, for all of these children with epinomoma. But today we have yet to really successfully translate some of those findings into the clinic that can, that can affect a child that's diagnosed today. Dr. Wong, just kind of um, following on from that, 
the I know that when our son was diagnosed, you know, subtype identification wasn't happening. Mm-hmm. With the with the identification of subtypes, is there a pattern that sub some subtypes are more likely to recur than others? Um, yes, that's a you know that's a great question that I think that um, Dr. Philbin and, and and Dr. Yock and others could probably answer as well. But um, but much like the other kinds of tumors and cancers, where you can start to split them off in different ways, um, typically biologically and with today's technology, you can say that this tumor is actually driven inside in a certain way, and that's different from a tumor bearing the same name, but having a different mechanism inside. And so there's no question that some of those tumors are more responsive or easier to cure with the approaches that we use today, which unfortunately means that some of those tumors are much harder to cure or, or much harder to treat. I think one of the sort of unintended consequences of us understanding so much more now, you know, pneumoma, despite being one of the more common pediatric brain cancers, nonetheless is a relatively rare kind of cancer. And now as Dr. Philbin was alluding to and was discussing, um, we can no longer really consider them all the same tumor because those molecular and biological drivers are so different in betwixt the different subtypes. And as you point out with your question, their outcomes, meaning their response to radiation, sometimes their response to other therapies like chemotherapy or immunotherapy, those two can be quite different. And so suddenly we have to start thinking very creatively about how do we figure out whether a particular treatment uh, is good for all children with epidemoma, or is it just a particular group of the subsets, or is it even just a subset of a subset? And so, um, and so those are challenges that we're facing now. So that's a good, that's a good uh, kind of segue into a question for Dr. York, and, and that is, you know, how has the discovery or the discoveries we've made in the biology and the advancements in those areas influence radiation oncology and how you approach these tumor types from a radiation treatment perspective? Mm. So um, that is a fabulous question, but right now um, we're still treating, I think, in the older paradigm. So when we have a certain biological subtype, we we just um, we say, oh, we're worrying a little more or we worry less, but we still need to treat them the same way. So as of yet, we're not delineating which patients will get post-operative radiation or not, although I know that's been a discussion with some of the subtypes, but it needs to be tested in the clinical trial to see if we can really get away with that approach. Um, um, yeah, so I, it hasn't changed much, but I think it, in the future it will as we understand more and as we test it in, in, a, in an organized manner. Mm-hmm. And has anything in the last 11 years since our son was treated, and, and this is, you know, I've, I've been good about keeping up with what's happening in the world of brain tumors generally, less so in the, in the radiation oncology world. So, you know, what, has, has anything really changed there in terms of how we approach some of these tumors? Or is, it, or is it, you know, I mean, the treatment our son had thankfully was very, very effective. Uh, you know, doses and targeting pretty much the same. Um, they are uh, they are the same. There's been a learning curve. So 11 years ago, um, you know, there were only a handful of proton centers in the United States, and not that many in Europe, and, and you know, none yet in Australia. And, and and now they've proliferated. And I think as the proton centers have proliferated, we've been able to um, learn a little bit more about it. And um, so I think we were very gung ho about higher doses, 59, 40. In tumors in the posterior fossa, we realized in some cases that wasn't so great on the brainstem. So there's been a learning curve across the community and um, and then maybe backing it down when you don't need to push the dose. But for the most part, as much as I want to say we've made dramatic progress, things haven't really changed that much. So um, we have fantastic protons, we have fantastic photons, but you still need to direct them appropriately. What, what has happened is that we've made some technological tweaks. So um, the planning has been better. We've been able to really understand uh, and, and use MRI technology to focus exactly where the tumor is. And I think in, in that result, uh, or in respect, margins have come down a little bit, meaning we're better able to focus just on the tumor bed and spare more normal tissue. But I don't, it hasn't changed super dramatically. Um, mm-hmm. um, you know, we've gone in, in, in the days that your son was treated, it was a passive scatter proton. Now it's a pencil beam proton. And everyone says that's a tremendous advance. Now that I've gotten to work with both of them, I'm like, 
it has advantages in certain ways and disadvantages in other ways. And so I actually kind of like having both when I had it, but now I just have the pencil beam, which is fine too. We can work with it all, but it's, um, it's, we're making progress, but it hasn't been as dramatic in the 11 years as it has been in the last 20 years. I think, right. um, I, I think hitting it when you did with your son was, was, was a good time. Yeah, we were very fortunate, I think, on the timing. Yeah, so we've heard about our journey, and I'd really like to hear more from Lindsay. As Bruce said, uh, I don't know if there's a Campbell relation, but the name is the same here. Um, Lindsay, we'd love to hear from you a little bit about your journey and um, diagnosis, treatment, and kind of what inspired you to join us today. Yeah. Hi. Um, thank you so much for having me. I love being able to talk about my daughter, Matilda. Um, I don't love her journey, but I love to talk to other people who've gone through what we've gone through. And had I had access to this kind of information, um, when we initially were diagnosed, um, I, I essentially we wouldn't be doing a whole lot different because we were lucky and we got connected to the right people, but it would have helped us to feel more secure in our journey, I think initially. Um, so our daughter, like uh, yours, like you mentioned, your son, um, she was diagnosed um, in 2009. Um, at the time, she was uh, 15 months old, and um, we did not know the world we were entering at that point. Um, we, our family, in particular, had not had any uh, cancer that we knew about or had any kind of sense of how to navigate things or even what it really meant. Um, so we kind of were led by gut and not much internet, <laughs> and um, we we're lucky enough to get a really good initial surgery. Um, and then we were connected with Children's National and um, we were able to get some good advice about what to do next. Um, I think it was really kind of an eye opener that the initial hospital that she was treated at had a completely different idea of what to do next than the hospital at Children's National. So at that time, I feel like there weren't there wasn't a lot of coordination, um, which as a parent was really frightening. Um, I knew we were at a good hospital, so I kind of went with my gut and I trusted what we were being told. And we did as much research as we could. Um, and we were, uh, so we had such a great surgery, so we had a really good start. And then um, we did um, chemo to buy some time because she was so young and um, feeling like things, we didn't really have much time left. We decided to do proton um, therapy with Dr. Yak and um, in Boston. And I mean, to this day, I feel like that really gave us um, a really good start. And it gave us a good six years afterward of um, clean scans, um, very little side effects, which we were really worried about. But given her initial... Um, prognosis, we thought we, side effects we can deal with. We just want her to be with us. We want her alive. Um, and um, she had very slight side effects that were very manageable um, and kind of feeling as though we were getting to a point where we could go into an MRI and not have a panic attack, <laughs> um, that we were probably in the clear. It was just a routine MRI um, it, that found a recurrence. And at that time, I knew that there really hadn't been a whole lot more um, happening, that, that we really were kind of stuck with the same treatments and that a recurrence meant something different than an initial tumor. And um, so we did the same things we knew. Uh, we did surgery again, which actually went well. And we did radiation again, because we had a good six, seven, six years um, since her last radiation that we felt comfortable that it was enough time that she could do it again. And um, then we were lucky enough to actually see that, that even though there were no clear answers at that point, there were more options. There were so many more options and so much more knowledge about uh, her tumor type, which at that point was about, a, I think we were thinking it was a PFA. Um, so we we felt a little more in control, even though we were facing a, a worse prognosis, if that makes any sense. Um, we had options, so we were able to do a few different things, um, which initially failed. And um, 
she or ultimately failed. Um, so she passed away uh, in 2019 um, and she fought and she did everything right. And she was brave and strong, but she, I hate saying that she lost her fight because I feel like we lost it for her. We didn't, we didn't equip her with enough information, enough science to kind of combat her tumor. Um, and I, that's why I still, uh, tell her story. And I still want people to know what we went through. And I do see kind of, I have been in this, I feel like long enough that I've actually seen things change. And I feel like now things are so much more hopeful than when we initially started. Um, there's even though Dr. Yak said that you still possibly treat them the same, even knowing that there's a lot more information at your fingertips. It's, it's a start and I feel like that's so incredibly important and there's hope, which, you know, 10 years ago there, you had one option and you did it. And if it didn't work, that was it. Um, so I feel like we've been through the survivorship. We've been, through, we've been the lucky ones and we've been the unlucky ones. And um, throughout all of it, Matilda was hilarious and funny and every single surgery she went through, and she went far too many surgeries, um, every surgery she woke up and told a joke that would have everybody on the floor laughing. Um, these kids are amazing, and um, you meet so many amazing families and so many dedicated doctors. Um, I think I get really defensive when people say, well, you're not, you know, there's an implication that your doctors don't care enough or they don't you know, have an interest in your child, but that was not our experience at all. Um, every doctor that, and every nurse that we came across cared so much about Matilda that I never felt like I was completely fighting this alone. And, um, and I see them still working hard and making advances. And I, I want to keep telling her story until there's nobody else who has to go through what we went through. And um, I just want to show a picture of her because <laughs> it's important. Absolutely. To um, I don't know if you can see that's what's up. She's adorable. <laughs> but she was um, amazing and smart and funny and like nobody else. And she would have changed the world. And um, I feel like we have to do it for her. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Your courage, inspiring, and uh, all that you do. And, and, and this is amazing that you're sharing this. So. Um, I'm sure other families are feeling really good to hear that story. So thank you. Incredibly yeah, brave. Yeah, thank you, Lindsay. Really brave. Um, I think it, we've got a, a lot of people actually coming in at that point asking questions. So maybe we'll turn it to Rachel and, and she could uh, share it with some of the panel. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much, Lindsay. I really appreciated you sharing your story too. Um, we have a couple of questions coming up. We have a lot of questions being asked and some of them are being asked, uh, asked and answered offline. Um, I would like to ask if people can put them in the Q&A. It's a little bit easier for us to manage than if they're in the chat, but we'll try and get to them all. Um, the first question I wanted to ask, it seems like uh, the PFA subgroups can provide a lot of insight on treatment options. When, when do you think that that type of testing will be clinically available beyond research? Uh, no, it's a, it's a really good question because I think that sometimes we get, we and not we get, we are really excited. Um, Lindsay, I'm, I'm so grateful that you were able to join us and tell Matilda's story. And, you know, certainly the parts that I was able to, to walk that path, I know that lots of doctors and lots of families are also walking there. Um, the parts that have really excited us as doctors and scientists about ependymoma are that today the difference is, is that we have new tools we know ependymoma a lot better than we've known from all the decades before. And the flip side is also true, which is that we have so many more tools, nor, nor uh, targeted therapies or immunotherapies or different kinds of radiation therapies that we're excited to try to apply in a way that makes sense. And we're just still trying to devise the best sort of way to do that. However, it's also true that sometimes what we see in the biology of a tumor, and I'd love to hear Dr. Philbin's perspective on this as well, uh, is something that takes us a little while to understand, meaning we see this difference. It's not the same as what is in a normal cell, and it may not be the same as what's in a different kind of cancer or another kind of tumor. 
Um, and so sometimes it's very easy for us to draw pretty quick conclusions um, and we may or may not be able to then act on that conclusion to, to actually treat that tumor. But the most fundamental component that we have to have confirmed is that when a test is being shown in a lab or in biology, we have to know that that test means what we really think it means. And that takes quite a bit of, of validation uh, and oversight and regulation because the worst thing that can happen, and, and I've certainly seen this happen in our own patients and with our own testing, is that we try to do a test that we think is really well seated and we understand it well. And then it turns out to give us an answer that was not what was the truth for that patient's tumor. And so then if you then act on the information, which turned out not to be quite accurate because the test just hadn't been quite bolstered up enough yet, then, then you made a grave error for that patient um, and probably subjected that girl or boy to a treatment that you may or may not have used had that test come out differently. So, so it's, it's a really great question. We have so much, uh, we have so many really impressive scientists who are pushing the limit to help us understand the biology. But the, what comes out in the biology always has a bit of a lag before we can act on it from a clinical standpoint for those reasons. But Dr. Philbin, what would you to say just for that, for that question specifically? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. And I think that centers around the country and around the world are more and more moving towards testing additionally. But I very much agree with Dr. Huang that we have to be careful in the tests we're using, how validated the test is. And ideal in epinemoma even use two different tests to confirm the same thing in one patient. And that's again, because epidemoma in many cases is not driven by genetic drivers that we can test, you know, like in many other cancers like lung cancer, melanoma. Um, so especially in, in the posterior fossa epidemomas, we don't have that one test, but there's a proxy test. It's an immunohistochemical stain that many neuropathology centers around the country are already doing that alone would not give, I think, anyone um, all the confidence to make any treatment decisions. And so we do a second confirmatory test that is a molecular test that's very complicated and it's based on looking at, at thousands of genes at the same time by methylation profiling. Um, and when that then also confirms what we see with the staining, then we feel more confident. And that's, that's only for the posterior fossa epinemoma um, because I wanna say that the, the epinemomas occurring in the upper part, parts of the brain and the hemispheres, they are often driven by a different mechanism. It's called a fusion, a gene fusion where one gene um, on one chromosome is for some strange event that we don't understand fused to another gene that usually or normally those two genes have nothing to do with each other, but all of a sudden they are next to each other, glued together and drive those epinemomas in the hemispheres. And that test for that is again, another test that we call a fusion test that also takes a few weeks to get back and also should be confirmed in most of the cases. So I very much agree with Dr. Huang, we're not quite there yet. However, you would find that most centers around the world are starting to implement those tests for epidemomas, even though we don't really treat differently quite yet, but I, I feel it's coming. I think that last point that Dr. Fulman said is, is a really good take on point, which is that it's one thing to even, even to have a 90 or if you're pretty certain that your molecular testing, whether or not it's been perfectly validated, is telling you something that you want to know about the tumor. The second piece that really has to go along with that is that it helps drive your clinical decision making. And so that is a translation component that we're working very hard now to, to, to implement, which is how do we actually act on confirmed biological information that seems to indicate a tumor is tumor A versus tumor B or something else like that. And, and that, part is, that part is difficult still. Uh, it remains difficult, I think, across cancers, although certainly in a pandemoma, it's been uh, particularly burdensome, I think. Thank you. Uh, we have another question about subtypes, actually. Um, uh, can a child's age of diagnosis narrow in definitively on a specific um, PFA molecular subtype? I can maybe go for that quickly. Um, I would not use the word definitely, but probably. So you can, you can narrow it down, but again, that alone wouldn't give me a great confidence to say, oh, this is definitely what it is. Um, but we know from, from the studies published over the last few years that there's definitely special ages where certain subtypes occur more frequently or less frequently. So it narrows. Great, thank you. Um, we're getting 
couple of questions about the ACNS0831 trial and um, wondering if the panelists think the preliminary results will change, have any change on the approach to treatment or if anybody would like to comment. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to, and anyone else can as well. So um, the, for those who aren't familiar with it, the ACNS0831 trial was the Children's Oncology Group ependymoma specific trial that tested chemotherapy after standard upfront surgical resection and radiation. And the whole question was, you know, there had been so many smaller trials before, some of which said that chemotherapy was actually helped, helped improve cure rates, and some which said it didn't do anything besides just add toxicity. And so our, our entire community was sort of in the state of equipoise. Do I do chemotherapy? Will it help them? It will certainly be harder on the child and the family um, for at least a period of time. And it may uh, induce side effects that, that could be chronic or even permanent. So we were a little bit worried about whether chemo was actually helpful for those patients. So the ACNS-031 trial, I think that was a 15 year trial. So that just is an indicator of how long it takes us to figure out a very specific question because the ependymomas, even as a whole group, are relatively rare. Um, and remembering that that trial was designed a decade before we understood anything about any of the molecular biology that we understand today. So as is pointed out by the question, it did seem to indicate that for some patients, there was a small benefit, meaning that um, for patients who actually took the chemotherapy as they were randomized to, that there seemed to be a greater proportion of those patients that were cured than if they didn't get that chemotherapy. Um, so that's very exciting. Maybe one of the first truly confirmed sort of advances in how we might treat all children or more children with, with ependymoma. And so right now they're going very carefully through the biology. Now that we also know this biology was never really built into the trial up front, um, but maybe that biology can help us understand which patients, if there are specific indicators in the biology of a tumor that would suggest that you should use chemo in that patient because they're going to get a benefit from it, that that is worth giving them the possibility of side effects and complications. Um, so I, I actually feel like, yeah, we're going to be using more chemotherapy for children with ependymoma. I, I suspect um, that the community will start to use it more frequently than they did before those results came out. Although I still am not sure exactly which patients it's gonna be most helpful in. It's certainly something that, that we are discussing upfront with every patient as we come in and, tr and try to come to sort of a, a path forward that we, that we agree on. And I just quickly again want to add to that what I already said before, I think the subtyping again will help so much or hopefully my hope is that once these same patients who have been treated on this trial that are now undergoing biological subgroup testing will really give us an answer to that question. It might not be, but my, my hope and my guess would be that it will be informative. And that will be great then. Um, I don't know how long these data will still take to mature and you know until it, they can be presented, but I'm really hoping that at that point then we can we can tell patients, okay, we, we now know that a certain subgroup really profits from chemotherapy or not. So there's one question for Dr. Yock. Um, people or families are wondering the timing of radiation therapy and if delaying it is, is appropriate in certain settings. If you could comment maybe. So that is a fabulous question. And, um, um, one that we, we have looked at. So in the setting when you have an initial upfront resection and then you have a little leftover tumor and then you give chemotherapy and then think about re-resection, um, that seems to be a, a good approach to potentially trying to get out that second tumor. But for those patients, um, and there doesn't appear to be anything wrong with that approach or, or, or related um, to, to to the issue there. Sometimes it's any gross residual disease, and when I say gross, I mean just visible on MRI, um, predisposes that patient to ha have a later um, pro disease progression. And so the idea of just allowing chemotherapy to help <clears throat> allow another resection is, is really helpful. However, if you take the other subset of patients that have had a gross total resection and you look at the delay to the start of radiation, um, we've just looked at this in our series of patients and we found that there was no harm in a delay up to nine weeks, which is interesting because in the, um, in the COG study, we, we, we tried to get the patient started before 56 days. 
And I know there are some patients who worry that it's an aggressive tumor, especially the anaplastic variants. So we try to get them going as fast as we can. There's actually some data out of MD Anderson that indicates if you start sort of before four weeks, there's a higher incidence of toxicity. And so that's uh, something that we're really thinking about what the optimal timing is. Um, I, I, think, um, I think you wanna have a good recovery from the surgery because most of these tumors are, not most, but two thirds of the tumors are in the posterior fossa. And there's a lot of important vasculature to the brain stem and to um, the cranial nerves and that sort of thing. And so I, I think it's safe um, after four weeks. And it, it appears to be safe to even delay up to nine weeks in our large series. But I think um, other series should look at this as well. But I think it's, um, uh, it's, it's reasonable to allow a reasonable re recovery period, um, provided it doesn't go too much longer than nine weeks. We just didn't have a lot of data past nine weeks um, in the population with a gross total resection that really comment. But we didn't actually find anything. I, hmm. I, I love to learn also from the other panelists, Dr. Yock. So there was old, there was an old study called CCG 9942, and there was a concern on that study. I thought that there were some patients who got chemotherapy prior to radiation who actually, not a lot, but you know, ten or fifteen percent who actually grew through the chemotherapy and then made their radiation field a little bit harder. Was that, is that just something that's not borne out anymore? No, I, I so I. I think that's true. If you're progressing on the chemotherapy, that's a that's a different different story. But if you have a, an active agent that you are not progressing with, then I don't think anything is lost, at least in sort of the paradigm that we're using it now to get to a try to get to a gross total resection, a couple cycles, sometimes four cycles. Um, pro, prolonged um, chemotherapy, what we used to do too, was in the very young patients is give you know, intensive chemotherapy and then wait till the patient gets to at least a year of age or wait until they get three years is what we used to do many, many years ago. And then in that scenario, we definitely found that patients recurred without an um, other local treatment, which is, is, which is radiation. So we don't agree with the paradigm anymore of giving chemo for the kids under three and then waiting until they're and we think they their the brains have developed enough to handle it. So I think that's a that's a good point. But I think there's a few things that we've teased out over the years. I think the current paradigm is 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 safe. I think the older paradigm, we were just trying to avoid radiotherapy in the younger patients because we didn't have such uh, we didn't have very good radiotherapy back then. It wasn't that focused. And I think we can get away with treating kids at a much younger age with um, better outcomes. Great, thank you. So there are two, two interesting questions I think being asked in different ways from the audience. So one is for Mariella maybe, sort of a question in the context of the molecular changes, how much does grade really matter in terms of outcome? And then the second question I will ask to Jean, you know, what is, what is the role of immunotherapy for ependymomas right now? And will it have a role and what are sort of the perspectives of it? Yeah, I'll start with the first one. Um, GRADE is still a little bit up in the air, I have to say, um, because GRADE is partly determined by how many cells divide are, are currently undergoing a cell division when you look at the tumor slide. And that alone is not, um, doesn't tell you really the prognosis as much. It is not correlated with the subtype as much as we thought. So our group and also others in Germany have looked at that. So the proliferative index or KI67 index that we call, that's not really um, indicative of prognosis or can't really tell you a lot. However, there is other features in the tumors that makes a tumor anaplastic. For example, a very abnormal shape of a cell. And that is more correlated to a worse molecular group. So that's a complicated way of saying um, it's not, there's not a black and white answer here. I think in the end, it will be what we now call an integrated, um, integrative molecular diagnosis, where you have a pathology diagnosis, really meaning that a pathologist looks under the tumor under the microscope, like we've always done it, plus the molecular tests that are confirmed through multiple centers. And all that together, then we should arrive at a, at a consensus diagnosis that then should drive 
treatment. And that's not just true for epineumoma, that's true for most of our pediatric brain tumors we're treating right now. This very, very big importance of the integrated molecular diagnosis in our um, treatment decisions. I, re I really agree with that, um, Dr. Feldman. But the, the other point that I, wanted, I would like to make is that um, what some of these really big studies have shown is, because what happens on a clinical trial, one of these big clinical trials, is that there's this team of pathologists and doctors and radiation, you know, it's it's a team that's really been thinking about epineumoma for a long, long time. And so, um, you know, the what I think what was found in, in several sort of studies in that way was that um, when you had multiple neuropathologists look at a particular epineumoma, epineumoma specimen, sometimes there was actually a little bit of uh, disagreement or there was discussion that had to be made about this question about what is truly anaplastic or grade three or what wasn't. And, um, and that I think in, in large part is because certainly, you know, the more you see, the more you sort of like start to be able to categorize things well. And so um, it, I think it was an advantage for children who had these, um, these sort of high level reviews in terms of determining anaplasia or not. But, but because of that, in some parts, I think that anaplasia, as Dr. Fullman said, has been, it's been confusing because it's not as clear cut by itself to, uh, to be a, a negative indicator so far. So I think we're just a little confused about what to do with that still. Um, the other question that Dr. Mueller was asking about that somebody had referenced was immunotherapy. So, so I am super excited about immunotherapy. There's no question that in many situations it has revolutionized cancer therapy. Treatments that were completely ineffective have been um, you know, causing long-term remissions. And so, so we've really been excited as a whole community for many kinds of different kinds of brain cancer, including a pneumoma. Can the immune system in fact be activated and then leveraged to attack either alone or in combination with, with some of the other things that we do, surgery and radiation and chemotherapy and targeted therapies. And I think that there've been enough examples that the answer is, is yes, that the immune system is smart. It can be active. It can attack tumors like a pneumoma. Uh, and because of that, there are a lot of clinical trials that are trying to implement different types of immunotherapy. And that is simply because the idea is to use the immune system, but the immune system is pretty complicated. And so the way that we turn it on changes from one kind of immune strategy to another kind of immune strategy. So there's, there are groups that are looking at all of them. Um, but Dr. Philbin can probably explain a little bit more, um, you know, the heart of where we typically are able to find the next treatments are not in testing the thousands of different kinds of medicines and immunotherapy that we happen to have in the cupboard against the 200 or so children who have epineumoma every year, but it's to test them in the lab and then decide this one works or this one doesn't, or this one works, but it needs to be combined with something, or it's better if it goes before the other thing. Um, and that's been a particular challenge for a pneumoma. And maybe Dr. Philbin, you can, if it's okay, it's my question, but I can ask Dr. Philbin. Yeah, no, actually that's, that's, that's a great setup, Dr. Wang, because what I was gonna ask is, is you know, what, what the panel's comfortable sharing in terms of the research approaches that you're currently involved in and, you know, projects that you might have, you know, under construction in this area, um, utilizing some of this newfound knowledge. Yeah, I, I would love to just quickly get back to what Dr. Huang just said, and I so much agree with that. I think our, our field, all of pediatric oncology, not just brain tumors, we've been, we've, the only chance we've had so far was just test the few drugs we had access to, no matter if we knew if it was going to work or not in our patients. And thank goodness those, those times are changing now that we first look in the tumors and then test in the laboratories and then bring forward really our best guess. We don't know yet if that's gonna be so much more successful than what we have done before, but we all believe, believe in science as a, as a way of progressing faster than before. And coming back to the immunology question before, even there, we, all we have right now are a few um, immuno-oncology agents that we know were found in adult cancers to be the, the blocking agents that you need then to give the patient and the immune system is unleashed. And we're now just starting with a big um, effort actually doc, uh, together with Dr. Klein here on the call to correct, characterize in, in real patients, in our patients on our PNOC trials, um, what the immune cells in the tumors, what they actually look like. Are they active? Are they inactive? How many are there? And who exactly are they? What kinds of different immune cells? And we've just started to do some very preliminary analysis of these results and it's quite fascinating. And um, what I want to say for now, before we do more analysis is that they are different. It's different from the adult settings. And so I believe that we probably have to um, make and give immunotherapy in a different way than we do in adults. 
So that's one thing. And then I just want to go, uh, go back to the other question of what was so difficult in epinemoma so, so far. One big, big um, roadblock was really access to models of the disease. And what do you mean by models? Models is um, a tumor taken out of a patient and then brought into a lab where we can continue to grow the tumor cells so we can test therapies. And um, that has been tried in many labs, but it's just really very hard in epidemoma to successfully grow when we get a tumor piece out of the operation room, grow that tumor piece into what we call a cell line that can be you know, kept for, for years and years and then shared with the community. So many of us have had maybe one or maximum two in our own labs. And it hasn't been until actually this epidemoma working group here um, within the PNOC Foundation that we started sharing. So we're just in the process of getting all the epidemoma researchers together and um, put everybody's models into an Excel sheet, old, old school, and said like, who has how many of what? And can you share it, yes or no? And that's currently undergoing. It's not as easy as you might imagine because we want to make sure those lines are all tested and so that we really know that they are what we think they are. But it's a great, great effort and a, a huge first step towards now that we have more models in, in our own labs, now we can test more, more therapies. So I'm very excited about this effort in this sense. Mm. And there's more things I want to want to talk about, but I want to give want to give the stage to others as well. Uh, we actually have a few questions coming in, and this is really probably best suited for Dr. Yock. There are questions about the difference with the photon and proton uh, radiation therapy. And, you know, we, we looked at that uh, also 11 years ago, and because George was only six, you know, we were trying to really minimize any deficits on that young growing brain. So maybe you could share some information about that too. Sure. So, um, so... Uh, in full disclosure, I get to use protons, so I'm, I'm a little bit biased towards protons. But what I have to say is that um, the photon technology has really been coming along tremendously. And the proton world has actually used a lot of the tricks that they developed in the photon world it's called intensity modulation and um, volumetric arc um, therapy and are trying to translate that into the proton world. So the difference between photons and photons is that photons enter the body and then they exit the body. And, and as a result, they, we, when we're using photons, we try to treat the tumor from a lot of different angles, triangulate on the tumor to get a high dose and sort of spread out that low dose to the rest of the, um, to the, rest of the, the body or the brain, and hopefully to an inconsequential dose. With protons, what we do, it goes in at a relatively low dose, drops its energy, and then stops. And so that's um, really beneficial in certain ways because it can decrease the dose to the normal brain. That being said, with the modern technology with VMAT, the, the low dose to the normal brain is actually super, super low. So what we, so I spent my research career kind of documenting what the outcomes are with proton radiation and trying to compare them with photon radiation. And I, and I think certainly to the photon radiation that we we're doing 15 years ago, there's a clear advantage to protons um, with sparing more, in this case, normal brain tissue. And that does translate. There's now a few clinical studies out there that demonstrate the real um, benefit in neurocognitive outcomes. Um, that being said, VMAT now, which is the, the fanciest form of intensity modulated radiotherapy with photons, is pretty fantastic. And so um, I have not pitched our modern protons against the modern VMAT um, in my heart of hearts because there's still no exit dose with protons. I still think it's going to be better. Um, but I, but I, but I, I want to say if you are in a country that doesn't have access to proton therapy, you know, VMAT therapy is pretty fantastic. And as long as you have a, a, a knowledgeable pediatric radiation oncologist who knows, who knows the tumor and how to target it, because like ependymomas, they, you know, we know where they hide and we know how they travel. And that's kind of the key, the key thing to know. But um, I am, in, in short, I do think protons are helpful. Um, they're expensive, they're unwieldy, and they're harder to deal with than photons. And so it's, 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 
it's been hard to have them, you know, it's, they can't proliferate in the same way that regular radiation can. Although that being said, I know there, there's now over 30, close to 37 proton centers in the United States. There's um, popping up all over Europe. So we're, we're getting better and hopefully it's kind of like PV technology, you'll get better and better, easier to manage and then the cost will come down too. But, but I think modern treatments, um, protons or VMAT photons can be pretty fantastic. Thank you, that's good. I think Rachel, you've got some questions coming in too. I do, so um, Dr. Huang, these are going to uh, be directed at you. I'll get you to unmute. Um, so two questions. Um, regarding a lack of vitamin D uh, and tumor growth, if you could comment on that. And the second question is about uh, CAR T cell therapies, just generally. Uh, well, yeah, let me start with the CAR T cell therapy one because that's something that I probably understand a little bit better. I see Dr. Mueller smiling because you know she knew that I'd be thrown by a vitamin D question. Um, but. So CAR T therapies, I think, are um, super exciting. So there's so uh, in leukemia patients, so patients with a liquid tumor that can no longer be cured for one reason or another, CAR T therapy has been tremendous and revolutionary. And so um, for those who don't know what that is, basically what happens is that a patient's a very specific sort of um, targeting subset of the immune system, these cells called T cells, um, they're basically soldier cells and they get sort of bioengineered in a laboratory and then given back to the patient. And the way that they're bioengineered is to, to train them so they can really attack, find and attack one particular target and then be really effective at killing that target. So that's been a challenge in brain tumors for a lot of different reasons, um, solid tumors as well. But in brain tumors, there are a lot of different obstacles to that being an effective therapy. That having been said, you know, it's been, you know, the, the way that this this product works, seems pretty intuitive. Um, you take out a bunch of cells, you grow a bunch of them, you train them to attack a target. As long as that target is present on the epinomoma tumor, then it should, hopefully, as long as it, it gets there, work well. The complexity piece of it has been, though, um, many fold. So one is that what we realize now is that unlike leukemia cells, where all the cancer cells in general harbor the same particular target that the, uh, the, the T cells can be trained against, um, solid tumors and brain tumors and ependymomas in specific have a multitude of kinds of cancer cells within them. You really, you know, ideally would need to find a, a T cell that could be trained to recognize all of them, but the way this bioengineering works most effectively is to actually get to attack one target. And so then, you know, I think that the, the field is trying to figure out a way around that. Um, but even if you can do that in the brain tumors and ependymomas in particular, what happens is that if you've got this great set of T cells to attack and you have a tumor that 100% of the tumor cells express the target that these T cells will recognize, the problem is that in this tumor and actually outside of this tumor as well is sort of this anti-immune protective shield. The tumors have leveraged part of the normal human's um, defense mechanism against too much immune attack. And so I think that what we have to do is figure out how that works and how to deactivate that sort of microenvironmental shield so that these other active, whether they're CAR T cells or other active immune cells can then not only get to the tumor cell, recognize it, but then actually get through and penetrate sort of this anti-defense mechanism so that they can kill the cancer cell. That having been said, I think that there are some really exciting and intriguing CAR T cell therapies that are included, but those include ependymoma and are actually specifically for ependymoma, meaning that they're targeting particular Antigens is what they're called, these markers that tend to be present more in a pandemic than even some other kinds of cancer. Um, there has not yet been a CAR T cell trial that has revolutionized anything for a pandemic, unfortunately, um, but we're always crossing our fingers that this next one or these next three or some element of those will be the next best treatment. Uh, I'm gonna, um, you know, I think I'm old enough in my career that I can admit where I'm sort of stumped. Um, and so I actually don't know very much about the effects of. Um, vitamin D deficiency in, uh, in promoting tumor growth. I'm Dr. Filburn, Dr. Mueller, Dr. Klein, um, Dr. Yock. If any of you knows anything about that, please turn in. Yeah, Rachel, you, you targeted me for that one. Well, I think, no, <laughs> no, I think we had some text miscommunication. So it, it, there were a few questions about sort of dietary supplementation and how things can, can either help with tumor control or promote tumor growth. And my perspective on this, and love to hear other thoughts, is really that we don't have enough data to support one way or another. 
I'm not aware of any data really associating vitamin D deficiency or higher levels of vitamin D with um, tumor growth or being a risk for developing epidermomas in the first place. Also in terms of dietary, we are often asked, yeah, are a specific diet better in this setting than another? And, um, you know, we, we are looking at, at some specific, like very specific diets, like it's ketogenic diet, where you really take out any carbohydrates. So there are some data in animal models, not specifically that I know in epidemioma, but in some glioma models, but even the data there is really not convincing enough, I think, that, that I personally recommend it. I, I generally recommend sort of a balanced diet, which I guess we all should, should have, and not too much processed carbs, but my assessment of the current um, sort of literature on this is that really there's no specific recommendation in terms of these supplements or any risk, but I don't know if others disagree with that. I, I do only, think that I, there, I, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just gonna say the only additional comment I would have is that some of the literature regarding vitamin D, I think has actually, in, in brain cancer, not specific to epidemoma, has actually ultimately been linked to general nutrition as Dr. Mueller saying, and kind of, um, I know there was um, a study that came out looking at vitamin D in uh, the context of actual birth weight. And so potentially thinking about kind of the hormonal imbalances more so than the direct impact of vitamin D. And so I think as Dr. Mueller is saying, these are the types of um, complex questions and um, uh, sources of why our patients develop brain tumors that we're only beginning to understand. Yeah, and the only added that I was gonna add on is that there's a really fascinating sort of burgeoning field in, meta in cellular metabolism. Mm -hmm. And so those are affected by things like glycemic indexes and you know, probably the, the vitamins. The problem is for me, and when a patient asks me this question is you know, this supplement like you know, turmeric or um, you know, some sort of other sort of herbal supplement or nutritional supplement or restricting diets such as what Dr. Mueller was talking about going on something like the ketogenic diet, the truth is, is that it's possible that something might be helpful, but there's so little information that there is. And in addition to which, oftentimes the information that is truly validated is conflicting, meaning that some studies say that this can help your tumor not grow. And some tumors actually, some studies can actually show that that tumor might grow more aggressively. And so my best advice is often, you know, do what feels right for you and your family. But at the same point, at the same time, not to hinge so much on one that you really you know, alter, alter what you think is your own or your child's quality of life for, uh, for an intervention, which is um, not only not proven to help, but may actually, you know, there's actually conflicting data on whether it might actually hurt in some ways. Um, so unfortunately, again, I don't have it. My, my nutritionists, though, are very adamant about vitamin D supplementation from a general health perspective. We all know that, unfortunately, when your child is going through treatment like this, they don't see the sun, their diets are, you know, affected by what they can eat and tolerate. And so good nutrition is really, really important, just like good physical activity is um, maybe doesn't fight the cancer well, but it certainly helps you tolerate the treatment much, much better. And I just wanted to add one more thing from the from the science side. There has been this field of tumor metabolism that Dr. Huang also just um, alluded to, and there's very interesting work out of uh, Dr. Taylor's lab in Toronto and Dr. Vanetti's lab in Michigan that indeed epidemoma cells have abnormal metabolism, but that's internal, like the cells internally have a different metabolism and not so much what, you know, your environment, what you eat gives the tumor cells from the outside. And it's even beyond that more interesting because it seems like the internal um, different metabolism is more baby-like. Again, um, underscoring the fact that epidemomas really might come from embryonal, very early baby cells that are stuck in development, so that the metabolism even is stuck in development and has not yet matured as they should have. But it's not clear at the moment at all if we from the outside can affect that. So, and especially not by, by food or anything. So more to come, but the field of tumor metabolism is incredibly interesting. And I think we will also learn a lot in the next few years. Thank you. Um, I wanted to just jump to a question um, for, for a child that's diagnosed with ependymoma, what is the likelihood of reoccurrence? I think that's probably a question a lot of people have. Um, I will, I'll, I'll take the first stab, but um, please, I want to hear what others say as well. So um, the old me would have said as a global ependymoma that there have been some 
longer term studies that have said, you know, instead of just looking at how a child is doing three or four years out, how is that child doing 10 or 15 or 20 years out? And that data becomes a little sketchy because the longer you go, the less reliable that data becomes simply because people, you know, they move, they don't, they don't upload their information quite as well. You know, people just get tired of tracking that data. Um, but ultimately, I think in those studies, unfortunately, about two thirds of patients were recurring. Um, but the question's a little more nuanced because we just got done talking about how some of these biological and also clinical, whether you got a gross total resection, what kind of radiation did you get? I think those things actually nuance it so much that you might actually say that for particular patients with particular biological subtypes that they have um, you know, a, a much, much, maybe even a near zero chance of recurrence and others where you uh, quite unfortunately, so that unfortunately we think that it's almost certain that your child's tumor will recur. Um, but you know, anyone else in the call, I'd be, I'd, I'd be interested in your thoughts as well. I just very much agree with with Dr. Huang. The the spectrum in in ependymoma is is very big. It really goes all the way, um, and so the more even more so that we have to learn more scientifically, so that we can make these predictions much much better. Thank you. Um, I think this is really a question that is one one of the whole purposes of of these webinars. Um, what are the most promising treatments and trials from the from the panel's point of view? I'm not going to go first, Dr. <laughs> <laughs> so um, maybe I'll take that from a scientific perspective again. We are trying to get to that. Um, that's a very frustrating answer. We're all aware of that. But one of the charges of our working group uh, within PNOC is to figure out what the most promising upcoming treatments are, because sometimes what is published as a great paper doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be the next best treatment. So the charge of this group is really um, to replicate, first of all, replicate any interesting findings anyone has worldwide in many different labs so we can have a better confidence in, okay, this is going to be it, or yeah, it didn't look so great after we looked at it in two different labs. And we're just at that stage. Um, so unfortunately right now, other than the standard treatment that Dr. Huang already mentioned, um, we have to hang in tight and, and look what's to come, but we're really hopeful that within the next year, I would say, right, right, Dr. Huang, we'll have some, some ideas for how yes. to start. Um, yeah, and what Dr. Philbin is alluding to is this group that is you know, in part helping to, to talk on this webinar as um, really a really interesting international collaboration of both by pure biological sciences. Dr. Fulbin is actually both a clinician and a scientist. Um, and then people like myself who are pure clinicians who just think about the clinical trial design. And the intent of that group is really one big intent. The primary, the primary motivating factor is to figure out what is the next best treatment, exactly that question. Mm -hmm. um, so now you've got a bunch of people who are really smart who are thinking only about a in a moment and we don't yet have that answer. It doesn't mean that it's not out there. It just means that we haven't quite gotten there. And I think that um, from our perspective, you know, the, the simplest thing would be to say, as Dr. Fulburn said, I think that surgery and radiation, those are components that we're not going to get rid of because they are so powerful. And in fact, as we said, some children can be cured with certain kinds of a pentamoma with those two things by themselves. Um, but then for everybody else, and that's who we really want to focus on, those guys are probably, we're probably going to have to leverage this biological information which means if we're true if the if we're true to the science that what is good for one kind of treat one kind of a pneumoma may not be as good for another kind of a pneumoma that is what makes this i think particularly challenging that plus the fact that we just haven't quite we're just getting online in terms of getting enough of those preclinical uh, models available but uh, i think in large part it's going to be a combination of the surgery and radiation uh, I, as somebody who loves immunotherapy, think that certain kinds of immunotherapy are very promising for a um, but also certain kinds of targeted therapy as well. And so I think that it's gonna be a, a combination that is gonna be not maybe patient specific, but, but tumor subtype or tumor sub subtype specific, that's gonna be the next best kind of trial. And so, so what we are currently struggling with as a full community, and then as a slightly smaller one within, the, within this particular group, is how do you make a clinical trial that acknowledges that, that says there's gonna be brand new, really exciting cutting edge biology that's coming out. 
And that biology through not only this group, but other collaborations, hopefully we'll have this crosstalk where the clinicians say, these are our real problems. And the biologists and the scientists say, okay, well, we're gonna figure out what's going on with those situations. And then they'll tell the clinicians, so these are what we think are the best bets for those problems you told us about. And then the clinician scientists, they kind of run their trials and they, they at the same time, they're feeding back information to the scientists. And so the scientists in real time are saying, oh, that's not what I thought would happen, or that's exactly what I thought would happen. And so then this, the trial itself becomes almost a living thing and all under this umbrella of how do we do this safely and sort of um, from a justifiable perspective for each patient uh, from, in the regulatory framework that we, that we do this the trials in this country. And so in a way, I am hopeful that that trial is gonna be the best trial. It's, it's not formed yet, but it's also an, an evolutionary trial, which means that what I say that trial is or what we say that trial might be in six months will be very different from what that trial is in a year and a half. And not because, not because that trial maybe didn't activate or was successful, but because we've acknowledged that we want this to be sort of a living, rapidly sort of um, evolving kind of trial that involved many different pieces at the same time. I know that's not exactly the answer to the question, and, but unfortunately I don't think as, as Dr. Fulman said, there is one trial that is the most promising. I think that it's going to take, uh, you know, this whole village of, of all this information, all these interventions. Well, thanks very much, Dr. Warren. I think what might be really um, useful context for this audience is to understand that the independent moment working group is a newly formed group. And if Dr. Mueller could actually maybe just give us um, some perspective of kind of the, what you've been able to achieve with clinical trials in the other groups, so that this audience can understand what's been achieved with some of the other uh, brain tumor subtypes in terms of clinical trial frequency and volume, which I think gives the ependymoma families hope as to where this is going. Yeah, no, thank you, Bruce. And I think we developed these working groups really with the, with the intent to get everyone who wants to work together to solve a specific brain tumor subtype problem to really bring this to the clinic. I mean, our, like, that was really the intent. It's really driven how can we design and bring forward the next best trial. And so for one of the working groups, the diffuse midline glioma working groups, we, we came out with two trials already. And I think exactly what Dr. Wong was saying, right? we are trying now to make these trials adaptive, adaptive that we can add in on arms what's coming out of the laboratory that we don't have to reinvent the protocol and that we are just starting to work with the FDA and have lots of discussion with our statisticians, Dr. Klein as well, and, and really trying to be faster in bringing really um, the trials into the new findings from these working groups into the clinics. I think we had great success. The same for the ATRT, we are close on, on writing up sort of a clinical trial protocol. So that's really the hope for the having the MoMA working group as well, that all this great knowledge is really then being built into a clinical trial. And I think the key is also that we need to maybe change a little bit how we conduct these trials, right? I mean, at the end of, we know what worked, what didn't work, but we rarely know if something didn't work, why it didn't work. If, you, if it worked, you, you, you couldn't care less really, but if it works, you work and you maybe don't need to know why it worked. But building in these specific correlative studies, going, sending patient samples back to, you know, people and scientists like Mariella to really understand why one patient is maybe benefiting, but the other one is not. I think that's really what we are trying to do over the next years. It's, it's, it's not easy, you know, getting everyone together, getting the regulatory agencies together, and then also I think many of us also strongly believe that it's a multi-modality approach, right? If it's two drugs from two different companies, if it's two different modalities, and we're talking about immunotherapy, maybe plus addressing the metabolic state, and how do you framework this with contracting IP issues with industry partners, which we are so dependent on? But I think we made really good progress. And I think also our industry partners are coming together. And it was actually easier than I anticipated for our first trial, getting everyone from the different industry partners on board. So I'm really hoping that within these working groups, you can also learn from each disease group, right? We set sort of a framework in one, how we set the overall structure of the trial. And other working groups can learn from this and vice versa, right? So I think um, that is really the goal of these working groups. So yeah, we are extremely excited and definitely thanks to Jean and Mariella for leading the Eppendemoma working group. Dr. Mueller, what do you say often, which is resonates with, you know, 
parents and families who find themselves in this position is that these kids don't have time. Yeah. And I think what's incredibly transformative about PNOC is not only the collaboration that you've encouraged amongst like-minded physicians and scientists, but the speed at which you're moving. Like, could you give us a sense of how many trials you've launched since you started PNOC and how many you've got in the wings? When we started end of 2012, we had sort of our first planning meeting with like eight or nine people, which was, which was really um, good. And then we started really in 2013 with Mike Kratos, who's obviously also here. And since then, we, we now have 20, 23 plus trial. We enrolled over 500 patients on PNOC trials. So we grew rapidly. And, and the other really, I think, a, a, um, a big um, mission of PNOC is really that all the data we're collecting on these trials, whatever we can make available, we want to make those available in real time so that we can attract as many people to work on the problems. So that's our collaboration with the Childhood Brain Tumor, uh, Tumor Network, which has been great so that we can deposit any genomic data right away so that as many people can work on it as, as want to. The other, I think, important aspect for PNOC was also access, right? I think in, in the United States, a lot of families, uh, are, you know, they have access to a lot of trial options, whereas in, in other countries, we really don't. So our international expansion has also been great. But it has also been great on the scientific level, I feel, because it brings in such great uh, complementary expertise also. And really, I think one thing that happened um, through this terrible pandemic, we got so close on Zoom, right? Now it, it's really complicated. <laughs> and we, have, we are trying to figure out time zones. I mean, so far, some of us, it's early in the morning or late at night that we meet. But really, we have so many also international um, scientists or clinical researchers joining on this working group, which has been really fantastic, bringing all this knowledge closer to everyone. So, yeah. Well, unfortunately and inevitably, we're over time, uh, like we've been with all of the webinar series so far. Um, I want to take the opportunity to thank the panelists um, for joining us today, you know, taking time out of their busy clinical schedules, and particularly those joining us from the East Coast who are well and truly past their dinner hour. Thanks so much for participating today. It's, it's, and, the, and the collaborating foundations, you've helped to promote the webinar series. And again, this one today um, to the audience, it's only by coming together and, and which is the culture of PNOC and, and working together, both you know, on the research, science, medical and foundation side that will really change the landscape of this disease for parents and their families. And, and for the kids afflicted by this disease. Just to let you know that this video is being recorded. So when you registered, you provided that we, you will see the link um, afterwards uh, on how to access it. And if you'd like to know more about these uh, PNOC clinical trials, go to PNOC.us. And if you'd like to find out a little bit more about the support of the trials too, go to PNOCfoundation.org. Uh, thank you to all of you for joining and, and really appreciate your time. Thanks everybody. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Cassie, cheers. <laughs>